Um, <coughs> Tech Tuesday is a collaboration between uh, some of the companies in the science park. You see them below here. Um, it's Sectra, SIG EVP, Ericsson, Nira Dynamics and Combitech. And the aim of, the, of these webinars is, like I said, to share knowledge between uh, all the brilliant minds that are acting in and around the science park. And now these days when we can do digital, maybe also outside uh, of Lean Shopping and the science park. Um, but I won't be talking that much more today. Uh, we have the pleasure to listen to Olof Sandberg at uh, Sectra. Uh, and uh, like you said, the title of the presentation today is to operate or not to operate. Uh, innovation provides orthopedists with data that revolutionize decision making. A very exciting title. So I really look forward to, to listen to you. So uh, I will stop sharing my screen and leave the floor over to you, uh, Olaf. Thank you, Anna, for that introduction. And let me share my screen then. Here we go. So I think that should be working. OK, Olaf Samba is my name. I'm an MSc PhD in medicine, and I work here at Sectra. And um, let's see, here we go. Sorry, I just need to fix that screen there. We have developed a new software that I want to talk to you about today. And for reasons that will become apparent, we have chosen to call it Implant Movement Analysis, or IMA for short. It's a tool that helps the surgeon deliver the right treatment to the right patient at the right time. And by the time you've finished eating that lunch, you will know a whole lot more about it. At Sectra, we have two sectors that we focus on. We have medical imaging IT and we have cybersecurity. I work at the business incubator, which is called business innovation. And we have four main areas of disease that we focus on. We have neuro, cardio, cancer, and last but not least, where I work, musculoskeletal diseases. This is Task Force Ortho here at Sectra. We're a mix of competences that enable, enables us to be world leading in 2D and 3D visualization and user experience. And we have a, a toolbox of different softwares that we provide orthopedic surgeons. And today we're gonna to be talking about the latest addition to that toolbox. Before doing that, however, I want to take one step back and tell you just a little bit about how big the impact of musculoskeletal conditions are on society. So a couple of years back, the United States Department of Health asked 100,000 inhabitants which medical conditions they had. And I think you will be surprised by the fact that even in the youngest cohort here, 18 to 44, one out of every three people reported some type of musculoskeletal medical condition. And as you can see, that number was the highest for any type of medical condition. And looking at the age group of 45 to 64, this number then increased up past half. So more likely than not, people answered that they had some form of musculoskeletal medical condition. Now, this could be things like neck pain, lower back pain, pain in the joints, those type of things. Notice that circulatory uh, is closing in on musculoskeletal there. And once we go to the eldest ones, the retirement age and above, 70% of people report some form of medical condition that has something to do with their musculoskeletal system. And we can see it's circulatory being the only medical condition that is more frequent. These people that answered in this questionnaire we're answering a lot of questions and one particular one I also want to tell you about today and that was a follow-up question where people who reported a medical condition was giving the crucial question do you feel that your medical condition has an impact on your daily life and on average the, uh, the answer was that about one out of three reported that I have a medical condition it has a negative impact on my daily life but if you looked at the musculoskeletal uh, group, as you can see, these were way higher and a big group of 
these people report negative effect. So no doubt we're looking at a group of people here that's big, that has real negative effects on their ability to lead the life they want to. And our tool IMA can help a subgroup of these. And those are the ones with uh, artificial joints. Now, why would you have an artificial joint? Well, when you have pain, for example, in the knee or in the hip, this can, of course, be caused by many different reasons. And depending on the reason, different solutions will help you. Uh, for some patients, it can be caused by cartilage degradation. As we can see in these images, uh, this doesn't look like a healthy knee or a healthy, healthy hip. And the cartilage, that's the slippery surface that enables us to run around and bend our joints with low friction and no pain. But for some, this cartilage can start to degrade and this will hurt more and more. For some of us, physiotherapy can deal with that and enable you to continue living your life as you want to. For some of us, we might require medication. And for some of us where the situation is bad enough, your orthopedic surgeon might um, suggest surgery. These are, this is for the people, uh, as orthopedic surgeons put it, that has a um, grinding toothache like pain around the clock. When they have it when they walk and load, they have it when they lie down. That's when you might have one of these surgeries. And here is a short animation of what it can look like. So the orthopedic surgeon first removes uh, the old tissue and puts in implants. And the thing that goes into the hip, that's called a cup, uh, since it looks like a cup. And it's made out of metal and plastic. And then this thing uh, that went into the thigh bone there, that's called a stem. Now, these type of surgeries, uh, they're common. Uh, in Sweden, we do about 16,000 of them each year. And we have uh, about 200,000 Swedes walking around with these type of hips. And in the States, they put in about a million uh, hips or knees each year. And to the person receiving an implant like this, uh, it's often described nothing short of a miracle. So you go from an existence where pain is a big part of your daily life into virtually pain-free. And partly because of this, these type of surgeries have been called operation of the century. And that was said in the 20th century. And perhaps then it's not so strange if we look at prevalence in, uh, this is a, a American population, prevalence uh, for different age groups and at different time points from the 80s and onwards, you can really see a dramatic increase in the number of people that have artificial joints. And if you had 2020 up here, it would be off the chart here and way high up here as well. These type of implants are really successful. And on average, uh, they will last you for a long time. So 25 years after getting an implant like this, 75% uh, of people will still have the very same implant. And that means that if you had it put in when you were 65, you're more likely than not to still have it when you're 90. So most people live their whole life with the implant that they receive. So far, so good and no need perhaps for our tool IMA. But, and this is a big but, the people that um, after receiving implants have problems, that is a very vulnerable patient group. Revision surgeries to go in and then try to fix if something is wrong with these implants, that's a very problematic and extensive type of surgery. And one orthopedic surgeon I spoke to put it like this, that there is really only one good surgery, and that is the first surgery. Then all the follow-ups, their lifelines, try, trying to piece things back together. And that can also be shown in this graph, where we see the implant survival, so not patient survival, but implant survival, uh, up to 15 years. And you see how it drops from 100, then it posts up uh, down towards 90, which is a really good number. And these are then for uh, the primary implant, the first one put in. 
if you were one of the patients that had a problem with your implant, some type of pain, and this could be often, and that is what we will focus on today, is that the implant, which should of course sit stuck to the bone, that it becomes loose. If you have that problem, or you might have infections or other problems, and you need some type of help, a revision, here we can see how the implant survival for your revision or your second revision or third revision, how that survival is really much lower. And this, together with how extensive these surgeries are, uh, is one reason why orthopedic surgeons are really hesitant to do these type of revisions, unless it's very, very necessary. They want to be certain that if you come to me with a pain in an artificial joint, and we are considering, should we open you up and replace it? Uh, we don't want to open you up and then realize that the pain you came to me uh, for, it wasn't caused by your implant being loose. So they want to be really certain when they investigate the cause that they have uh, the correct answer and how to remedy it. And here is the problem that we address with our software. And that is the problem that today, the tools that they have are a little bit too often found lacking. And the reason is that if you want to look at implant loosening, so whether or not something moves, um, the tools that they have are all of them based on um, still images. And it's not so easy to see movement in a still image, but what you can do is that since the implant uh, sits in bone, and bone is a living tissue. If something sits and moves back and forth like this, the bone won't like that. So it will start to go into osteolysis, osteo as in bone, lysis as in dissolving. And what the doctors then look for are these secondary signs of implant loosening. And osteolysis, if the bone is dissolved, in this x-ray here of a hip, you might be able to see that it's a little bit darker here. That is because the bone there has partly dissolved. And looking for these secondary signs, doctors can most often uh, realize what is the situation here. You came to me with pain. I'm thinking about implant loosening, but does it look like, can I see these secondary signs? Most of the time they can from these simple methods. And they also have others like computed tomography, which allows you to look all of the slices one by one, plain x-rays uh, take all of it at the same time, or more exotic types. <clears throat> and this helps with most patients. But uh, if you know, ask any orthopedic surgeon that I have spoken to, they will say that much too often they are uncertain. And depending on the patient and all these things around it, they might come and say, I don't have enough uh, material here to recommend this extensive revision. And what I suggest that you do is you go home and you take pain meds or you do your physio and let's see in a year how it looks like. And if the implant was loose, that osteolysis uh, situation will continue to degrade and the problem will become larger, perhaps so large that it will show up on an x-ray in a year. And this is where our tool really comes in to play. IMA, Implant Movement Analysis. It's basically another tool for the orthopedic surgeon to look at their patient and try to understand the situation. And what it does uh, differently from the other tools is that you don't have to look at the secondary signs. Instead, you will be looking at the movement itself. I will tell you how that uh, is. But what it means for the orthopedic surgeon is another option. Rather than telling these patients, go home and come back in a year, they would be able to say then, or they are able to say, go and have that IMA scan. And perhaps you can even replace some of the other options with it. And the way IMA works, it's basically rather simple. And surprisingly, it has a little bit to do with uh, this old favorite movie of mine, Jurassic Park. So if you remember this movie or this scene, this T-Rex is looking for Dr. Grant and the kids. And Dr. Grant very knowingly tells the kids that let's stand still because 
eyes of a T-Rex is based on movement. And it occurred to me whenever I create a PowerPoint uh, that actually it's really hard when you do PowerPoints and you want the uh, different slides to, to line up so that it doesn't move. And the slightest difference is immediately apparent, like the top right here. You see any difference in movement. Compare that to a situation like this. If you want to compare and see, okay, are they in the same position? So this is the main, uh, one of the main operating principles that we based our tool on. Of course, we're not working with T-Rexes, sadly, uh, or we're working with people. And the way we do it then is we have not one image, we have two images. And they're different in a very important regard. And that is, as you can see, this patient is bending their neck backwards and forwards. And that means that we have two different types of loading on the implant, which is uh, uh, the red object here. The object, uh, the implant will be loaded in one direction in that CT image. And then the patient repositions, another CT is made, and this implant is now loaded in another direction. And what the IMA2 does is it overlays the implant and it provides the one looking at the images with this situation. Now, this type of implant should be fused to the vertebrae around it. And as you can tell here, it isn't. So it is loose. And that tells an orthopedic surgeon a lot of crucial information about how they should help their patient. Looking at a hip that we have spoken about before, how does that look like when you take these images? Here, a foot is rotated outwards for one CT image and then inwards for another CT image and the CT images uh, look like this. So here you have your cup and that stem that we saw in the animation before and it's a slight rotation. It doesn't have to be that very large. And these uh, images are sent to radiologists, so doctors that are trained with looking at the computed tomography images and they use our IMA tool they indicate for the software which part which should be overlaid and the computer handles that and provides the doctor with images looking like this. So before I press play, I've learned that it's, it's uh, once I press play, people stop listening to me and start looking at the video. So I will talk you through what we're looking at first and then we will animate this and see what happens. This is a patient which had a revision surgery, a cup put in, and unfortunately uh, was one of the patients that were not satisfied. So on load of the leg, the patient was in pain, came back, the surgeons were uh, unable to find the source of the pain. And it went on like that for, I think, two or three years before they did an IMA. And we will soon see what the surgeon saw, uh, which was the cause of their pain. And they could then devise a strategy how to help them. But what we're looking at here is the hip. This is the hip bone. And we're looking at, <clears throat> this is metal. That's why it's so very bright. And this is that cup and a screw put into the bone. And here you see uh, the, that stem that goes into the femur. So once I press play, this part of the bone will be standing still in the image because it is what I am a uh, overlaid. <clears throat> and then the primary question is, will we see a loose implant here? Notice that a lot of things are happening in this image. You see that there's a lot of noise that goes back and forth. But if you focus on the main outline of this rigid body that was standing still, you'll appreciate that it is not moving in any direction, it's standing still. And moreover, if you turn your attention to the cup, the big metal thing here, you'll appreciate that it's standing still as well. So this patient's pain on loading, it wasn't caused by a cup being loose, meaning if the surgeons had gone in there with a plan to remove this cup, they would uh, have done so um, for the wrong reasons. However, if we turn our gaze on this part, we notice that because this is the pelvis, same as this one. So you don't want any movement between this part and that part. And this turned out to be the cause, which they had missed so far was that this patient had 
a pelvis which was fractured. And that was why it hurt when she walked. And then they were able to devise a treatment strategy based on that. As you can imagine, you can use this not only for hips, for example, or you can also use it for knees. Now we're down, this is your, or this is the knee, and we have the tibia, as it's called in Latin, and femur, or, or shin bone and thigh bone. And here is an implant. And here's another patient with pain, another question about, is it loose? In what way is it loose? And when I press play, this bone will be standing still, and we'll see if this tibial component, as it's called, if it has any movement when you load in different directions. So if this was a healthy implant, this wouldn't happen. You wouldn't have this movement of the implant. It should be stuck in the bone. Once again, the surgeons know what they're dealing with, and they can then devise a plan. But the most common type of answer is one like this patient that I will show you in a second. <clears throat> We're once again back with the pelvis standing still and we have a cup here. And the question once again is patient with pain, they have one artificial joint, could it be that the cup is loose? And if we animate this, jumping between the two different loading conditions with the cup, oh, sorry, the pelvis matched so that it's standing still, we see the most common type of answers that comes back from these, which is that there is no implant loosening. And last but not least of the examples that I will show you today, I wanted to show you lower back. So now we're in the spine and here you have uh, what's called the saccum, the lowest part and you have the vertebrae above that one. Here is a patient where they have tried to fuse these two rigid bodies. Sometimes when you have a lot of pain, a surgeon can suggest this as a way to try to alleviate that pain. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, it's very tricky or it has been very tricky for the spine surgeon to realize, is, does it still hurt because I failed with uh, the making this these two vertebrae not move or are there other reasons that it still hurts so if we animate this now and hold the sacrum still if this had been a successful um, surgery you wouldn't have seen this vertebrae move like this so here the patient has between the two cts uh, bent forward and backwards so you have two different uh, mechanical loading conditions and this isn't a rigid body, which tells the surgeon a lot about how best to help this particular patient. These type of answers come back from a radiologist to an orthopedic surgeon who sent uh, their patient to get an IMA scan. So what can this orthopedic surgeon do with the answers? Well, either the answers are, we couldn't find any significant movement, or the answer is, we could find that. If the answer was that we couldn't find significant movement, that tells the orthopedic surgeon, I mean, uh, the pain is still there for my patient. I have a range of hypotheses. One of them was implant loosening. What I see on these images tells me implant loosening is most likely not the cause. Then you can continue looking for others, other reasons. You can also use these images when you um, talk to your patient and your patient can see with their own eyes and um, one really crucial thing can be that you can avoid surgeries that were unnecessary, which is of course a very good thing, rather than, which does happen, opening up a patient because you suspect implant loosening and finding your implant is not loose. Uh, you can avoid that. And all of these things taken together means that you can save a whole lot of suffering and cost for society, hospitals, the patient, everyone. If the implant was loose, this means that the orthopedic surgeon didn't have to send their patient home for a year. They could get this treatment one year earlier and with all the benefits that gives the patient. It means also that the orthopedic surgeon is better prepared. Not only does he or she see if it is loose, but they can also see in what way it is loose. Uh, sometimes one part of the implant is loose and another part isn't. This makes a big 
difference for the orthopedic surgeon when they prepare for their surgery. Will I be able to just lift the implant out or will I have to hack away, whack away, put effort into getting out the implant? Being able to do the surgery earlier also means better prognosis for the patient because that osteolytic situation we were talking about, it has not been progressing for one year additional with all the negative effects that have on the bone health. These things together means that you can save a lot of suffering and costs. We have experience from IMA being used uh, for the last couple of years. And I want to show you a little bit of what has happened with the way that doctors diagnostic flow of their patients, how they handle that. So before IMA was introduced, uh, we asked surgeons, okay, when you send your patient, patient uh, with pain and with uh, an artificial joint, when you send them for plain x-ray, how often do you feel a need for additional information? And those surgeons said, difficult to answer, um, 90% of the time, I feel I don't need additional information. Okay, then we uh, um, observed what happened when we introduced IMA in a center or when the center introduced IMA rather. And very interestingly, those 90% were no longer 90%. It, they were more like 60 to 80%. And the other ones were sent to IMA. So obviously, uh, or it could be interpreted rather that uh, there, is, uh, there were some patients there where you did feel, okay, I will do like this. I don't need additional tools. Uh, but when you had an additional tool that could provide this primary, uh, this showing if the implant is loose, they could feel a need to send more patients to that. And as I said before, most of those patients that were sent to IMA it turned out that the implant wasn't loose. I want to tell you just a little bit also about how this tool has been developed because we're very proud as Sectra with ver working close to the clinical reality. I showed you task force ortho here at Sectra. And here is another task force or it's Karolinska Institute, a group there, who were the ones who defined this problem and how to solve it. And it's a big group, obviously, uh, Henrik and Lars, who I show here, they're at the center of this, uh, um, but uh, they will uh, symbolize the group in its entirety. Uh, back in the early 2000s, they identified the problem I have been laying out for you today. The problem of needing one additional diagnostic tool in the toolbox. They also defined a way to solve it very nicely um, by using computer tomography and these different loaded CTs so you can compare the two CTs. And why this happened in the early 2000s, one reason that um, <coughs> was that CTs began to lower their radiation doses while increasing the resolution at the same time as computing the power in PCs was increasing as well, meaning these image registration uh, algorithms were easier to, to do. So uh, they built a software and they tested that software very successfully over a number of years. And I think there are some 30 plus publications on this. And they showed that their solution strategy worked. And they then formed a company which, uh, through which they attempted commercialization of this. And perhaps because it was such a new concept, uh, they found out that having a good solution uh, doesn't take you all the way. And you need a lot of other expertise. And so they decided to turn to Sectra which they knew had excellent reputation when it comes to software in medical imaging. And more specifically, here comes Task Force Ortho. We took a look at their problem that they described at the solution strategy they had, and we rebuilt a new software from the ground up with uh, expertise knowledge from Henrik and Lars. Lars passed away last year very, uh, sadly, uh, but they have throughout this process been very um, 
close to us and Henrik and I, we still speak every week, more or less. Uh, and with their expert expertise, we built this new software, which was able to increase the quality of the results even further. And we are now for the last two years, two, three years or something, commercializing this IMA tool. And with their help, we have managed to build what orthopedic surgeons that I've spoken to, many of them call a paradigm shift when it comes to how you can diagnose these type of patients. And we have also together been able to attract research grants as well as orthopedic surgeons and researchers around the world. So does that mean that we are home free? Of course not, we're moving forward. And the aim now is to grow the user experience and add on more clinical research and try to build awareness within the profession that this tool exists and get people to test it. And what we see that people do is that they think about how their diagnostic strategies can change to take this new tool into account. And they are also reconsidering things such as what is loose. If you have a tool as this tool that allows you to see minuscule, very small movements, you might have to rethink a little bit what is loose. Is it always clinically relevant just because we can see it? So this is something that the clinicians are considering. And we are, of course, um, at the same time, working with the uh, issues that has to do with scaling when service support and as, um, as those who work with hospital IT knows, this can be quite a challenge. And I, here is my uh, email. If anyone has any question, you're very welcome to email me on this. And before I leave the word back to Anna, I want to just finish where we started, which is with the patient. And we're very proud uh, that Ima has already helped over 400 patients. And we can see that this is only just the beginning. And I see Anna that you are jumping into a screen. So let me stop this uh, presentation and let's see if anyone has any questions. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Olof, for this presentation. Really interesting. And I really, uh, like you said, the patient in, in the middle, but also to see what technique can help with for their, um, their journey. Uh, we got actually some questions in the chat. Uh, the first one from Mehdi. Um, who, um, as what's the risk for false negatives or false positives with AIMA? Excellent question, Mary, and nice to meet you or see you because we used to be colleagues back at the university. Uh, the answer to that, I think the best answer to that comes from the clinicians, Henrik Olir Gunnar Lars Wenningel. They have been testing this in clinical practice for the last 10 years before we came into the scene. So I asked him this question, very qu same question as you did. And he said that throughout the hundreds of patients that they have had, when IMA has said that it uh, was loose, and uh, they did go in and open up because whether or not the implant is loose, uh, you need, of course, to open up the patient to be really certain. <clears throat> and as they uh, phrase it is that uh, the orthopedic surgeon owns the answer to that question because it is the one who treats the patient when they are doing that that can um, tell you whether or not it was loose but he said that over the years uh, with the hundreds of patients they have seen they have yet to find that ima showed a loose implant which they then when they opened up was stuck then the other way around of course is the question if ima said this implant isn't loose and the orthopedic surgeon based on that did not open up the patient. How do you know if that was a correct answer, yes or no? There is a study back in the 90s with some 50 plus patients uh, where they uh, did this, looking at this, and they found a sensitivity, specificity, I think both were around 90 plus percent. That was with a tool where they uh, didn't have a software helping them to analyze it. Uh, instead, they analyzed it themselves manually. But that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is uh, unpublished data that a collaboration partner is looking at right now, where they have followed up patients for two years. 
And uh, if you were to have a loose influence and two years later, uh, you still did not have a deteriorated um, situation, that can then be interpreted as a strong indication that the implant wasn't loose. And that was what they found in, I think, 18 out of their 20 patients that had the IMA not loose. But otherwise, if you really want to uh, show it 100%, you would have to open up patients that you have deemed did not need opening up. And uh, for natural reasons, no surgeon wants to do that. Thank you for that answer. We have one more question. Um, what materials can EMA work with in case of implants or parts of implants are developed with other materials? Anything that shows up on uh, CT. So anything that is radio dense. And uh, actually I, I tried to keep it uh, a little bit simpler. So I removed some aspects, but you don't need implants either. Sometimes you have a patient that you're thinking about the fracture or something, and you, you want to see if different parts of bone move relative to each other. So you don't need implants in there, uh, but that's the main how, how it's used. But anything that shows up on a CT. Thank you. Um, we also got a question from Daniel Brolin. Couldn't a source of false negative where IMA showed the implant to be fixed be solved by other angles of X-rays? since maybe the implant is loose in other dimensions and X-rays is only 2D? Good question. So this is in, uh, I showed you uh, one, when I showed you those videos, it was one slice. If we were to have had more time, I could have scrolled through those and shown you from very uh, different angles because you're quite right. Something that appears to have no movement in, in one direction if you looked at it from another one, it might move a lot. So when you do these analyses, the way the radiologists do it is that they do scroll through because this is computed tomography, which means you can look at it from different angles and they do. So uh, you're right and that's how we do it. Great. Um, one other question from Lars Hugge. When the orthopedist was certain and the image was not sent to IMA, about 60 to 70% was it, is there any test of those images with IMA? No, because you need those, you don't do these loaded CTs uh, for any other reason. So uh, because the patient was first sent to this simple plain X-ray with very low radiation dose and cheap and simple and fast but not very informative perhaps. And if they were happy with that, uh, then you don't have those images because the images do, uh, I realize I could have stressed that uh, more clearly in my explanation, but you need those two computed tomography scans with different loading. And that's not something you do unless you want to do IMA. Great, uh, thank you. Um... No more questions in the chat. We are not that many. So if there's somebody who wants to ask a question, feel, please feel free to just turn on your uh, microphone. Um, we'll just wait a second if there are some more questions. Uh, otherwise, maybe all of you have the possibility to be just be uh, in the meeting for uh, a few more yeah, minutes. Sure. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you very much for this presentation. It is really interesting and I really, uh, there is so much, um, so much going on in the companies in the science park and around. Uh, and it's really, really exciting to hear more about that. Um, next Tuesday, Tech Tuesday will be in a week, actually. Uh, it's a shorter coffee break together with uh, Ericsson showing some of their material that they recorded for, um, a big fair last year. Uh, so I hope to see you there. Uh, all uh, this event and all the other events you can find at our webpage on the event uh, site there. So a big thanks uh, to you, Olaf. Thank you for listening. <laughs>